So our next presenter is Jacinta Johnson. Um, Jacinta is a paper conservator um, who works for the Spencer Museum of Art and the University of Kansas Libraries. Um, so becoming a professional conservator, there's a lot of education involved in that, but there are things that you can do at home to take care of your, um, your own special items. And so Jacinta is here to help us learn more about how we can conserve our family heirlooms. So, Take it away, Jacinta. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All, all right, great. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, Melissa. Uh, like she said, I am a paper conservator working at the University of Kansas through a collaborative conservation initiative that's funded through the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And it's through this initiative that I complete treatments for works on paper for both KU Libraries and the Spencer Museum of Art. So I'm gonna take about 20 minutes to share with you some practical information about how to take care of your home collections, and then we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. So I'm gonna share my screen now. All right. So I thought I would start out by first briefly describing what conservation is and what conservators do. Conservation is essentially a group of actions taken to preserve cultural heritage for the long term. And I've attached some of my favorite pictures of that really summarize a lot of the activities that I do as a conservator. Uh, we perform examination and treatment. So you can see in this picture on the far left, I'm using a microscope to look more closely at a print and documentation really involves a lot of things. We write a lot of written reports that describe the object and its condition. And then we also document objects photographically, especially when we perform treatment. So we take a picture of the object before treatment takes place and then again after. And as I said, um, we do treatments. And so what that means is sort of a direct intervention, um, either mostly it's a repair um, that's done to an actual work of art um, in this second picture I'm performing a tear mend on a hokusai print of the wave um, and the the treatments are often um, a discussion with many people so we don't just perform them on our own as conservators for an institution it's a discussion with a curator or if we're working in private practice it's a discussion that we have with the owner to talk about what materials we're planning on using and and what the outcome will be Another activity that we perform quite a bit is what we call preventive care. So in this third picture here, I'm looking at some prints and inspecting them for signs of mold. Just like preventive medicine, we try and find a lot of risks and identify them and mitigate against them, against them ahead of time so that we don't have um, a problem later on down the road. And we're going to talk about preventive care quite a bit in just a minute. And then all of these activities really are supported by a lot of education and research. And so um, sometimes we look really deeply into a material in this lower um, image here on the right. Um, I'm taking a workshop learning how to make hanji, which is Korean paper. And we use it a lot for tear mending and we also um, treat art that's made out of hanji. And so it's important that we understand materials. So conservators can work in a variety of settings like libraries and archives, museums, and they can also own their own private practices. Here is the new KU Conservation Lab at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library. It's just about to turn two years old this summer. All labs can look a little bit different depending on the specialty. So a paintings lab or an object lab is going to look a little bit different. Um, this particular lab is set up to take care of both circulating and non-circulating collections for KU libraries. And now through my position also works on paper from the Spencer Museum. So we love bringing classes and tours into our lab and we love sharing our work. Um, this type of in-person sharing has been postponed at the moment, but um, I did want to make sort of a shameless plug about the many ways that we're still working on reaching out to you all. Um, above at the top is my Instagram handle, which I invite you all to follow. Also, please visit the Spencer Museum's website. They've launched a couple of new ways that you can explore the collection from home. And then, of course, the Kenneth Spencer Research Library has a really fantastic blog that, blog that is continually updated. 
Okay, <clears throat> so let's kind of return to this preventive medicine concept. Collections professionals have summarized factors that impact the overall change to materials into what are called the 10 agents of change, otherwise known as the 10 agents of deterioration. People use those terms interchangeably. We use these agents as a kind of checklist to assess risk levels for our particular object, and then we set up interventions to mitigate against these risks. Following this checklist is one of the most important actions you can take to, to take care of your collection because it can really help prevent expensive conservation treatments down the road or worst case, just complete loss. So we won't cover all of these today, but I am going to highlight a few to get you started on your own collections care. So light, as we know it, is a type of radiation to which our eyes are sensitive. It can be quite damaging to materials, especially objects made from organic materials like textiles, works on paper, leather, skins, basketry, feathers, and photographs. Light, is da light damage is cumulative and unfortunately quite irreversible. So while we need light to enjoy our objects on display, there are several ways that you can help to minimize this damage, and they're pretty practical. When you're displaying your object, just try and keep them away from windows, or if they are in front of windows, close your blinds or close your shades when the light is coming in directly during that time of the day. Also consider rotating your objects on and off view. This doesn't really rest your objects or regenerate any color, but it does buy you a lot more time if you rotate more regularly. And then for any framed work of art, a painting, a print, a sampler, you can install what's called um, ultraviolet filtering glazing, which is either acrylic or glass that comes in the frame. And that can at least eliminate ultraviolet radiation, which is another form of radiation that's a little bit more powerful than visible radiation. And we don't need it to see objects. So that's why they put filters on the glazing and that can at least reduce that damage. But again, even if you have that ultraviolet filtering, you still want to minimize light exposure in general. So two other agents of change that relate to one another are incorrect relative humidity and incorrect temperature. So very high temperatures promote faster chemical reactions, and then that relates to a faster overall degradation of your object. Very low humidity can cause media to shrink and crackle and become brittle. Very high humidity, so what we're starting to deal with now, means that your objects will start to take up a lot more moisture, and that causes things to swell more and under very high sustained relative humidity, so about 65% or higher, that also creates a really good climate for mold growth. And so in this picture here, this was actually a historic baseball uniform that was stored in a suitcase that was stored in the basement, and so it developed a lot of mold. So what are some ideal storage conditions then in your home? Well, unfortunately, most of us probably don't have really fancy HVAC systems, and that's okay. What you want to do is you want to locate a really good place in your home where the conditions are the most stable. So a linen closet in your hallway on the main floor can be a great uh, selection. So in general, we recommend around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty much close to what temperature you're going to want for your own personal comfort, and a relative humidity of around 50%. If you want to monitor things a little bit more closely, you can always invest in one of these fairly inexpensive hygro thermometers, which monitors both temperature and relative humidity. You can get this about for about $10 at the local hardware store or online. And of course, this also means that you want to avoid spaces like the attic or the basement that sees these very extreme swings. All right, so there are so many pests that like to feast on collections, and we like to monitor them all as conservators. Um, silverfish, like you can see here in this illustration, uh, is particularly harmful to works on paper. They like to sort of graze across the surface where all that yummy starch-based surface sizing lives. But bookworms, book lice, termites, cockroaches, mice, these all can cause a lot of damage to your collections, especially the organic materials like textiles and wood and leather. So it's important that you monitor them. We like to use these sticky traps and you can find these online through various online retailers. And um, you wanna place them right where the floor meets the wall. 
because that's where most of the bug highways are. And um, it just helps you to know kind of what is living in your spaces. And if any of those bugs that I listed, um, are, you're catching a lot of them and it's in a place where you're storing your collection, then you may want to consider moving them or figure out where this infestation is coming from and really deal, deal with the problem. Good housekeeping is also a great solution. Dust is a great um, source of food for pests. And so housekeeping in general can really help. And um, it also helps you to kind of periodically check in on your collections. Textiles in particular can hide clothing moths. Um, the larva of the clothing moth actually likes to feed on the fiber. And so if you pull out your textiles from time to time, unfold them, inspect them once a year or so, that can really go a long way to help stop a, an infestation station before it becomes worse. All right, another agent we're going to discuss is disassociation. And what this basically means is that important information about the object has been lost or an element has been lost and so you no longer really get its whole context or where it was coming from or where, what there is or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, You just don't know much about it anymore and no one can really weave together that story. So in a home collection, labeling can really go a long way. There are lots of ways to do it. If you have a work on paper collection, photographs, family papers, you can place them in an envelope or a box and then label the outside. We recommend using graphite pencil like you see here on this envelope. But you can also directly label your photographs and papers by just gently writing with graphite pencil on the back along the bottom edge. Another really great solution is pictured here on the right. Um, this is from the university archives at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library, where they've just attached little inkjet prints of the, an image of the object. And so you don't have to unwrap everything to see what's inside. And so that works well on rolled up things, but you can also paste that to the outside of a box. All right, now let's talk about pollutants. So pollutants can involve acidic gases and ozone from the environment, but also particulates like dust and dirt and soot. And like I said, dust is one of those um, really wonderful sources of food for pest and um, because it has this very large organic component. So there are a lot of ways to protect your objects from pollutants, really good housing like you see here on the left, and framing your objects with glazing, so an acrylic or glass cover, um, are really great uh, solutions. And we'll talk more about housing here in a second. But what if you want to display your object and they don't really fall into the camp of being able to be housed in a box or framed? Well, you're going to be doing some periodic cleaning of dust and there's some really great strategies that I'm going to share with you depending on the material. So for cleaning books, I recommend investing in one of these fairly inexpensive um, vacuum attachment kits. Sometimes they're called upholstery attachments and it comes with an adapter. So that's this little guy here. And that attaches to most standard size vacuum hoses. And then that allows you to attach the smaller hose that fits these smaller little brushes. <clears throat> and so these brushes fit very nicely in most standard size books. And we recommend just vacuuming across the top and the fore edge and the bottom of your book. And that really goes a long way. Now it's important that you grasp your book tightly so that the pages don't flutter around during the vacuuming process. So hold the covers tight and then just gently tap your vacuum brush across the top. If it's a very fragile book or if the bristles are pretty rough, you can always take a soft natural fiber brush and brush the dust into the vacuum as you work along. A microfiber cloth is another really great tool to use for cleaning. We recommend one that is lint free and sometimes they come with cleaners inside them now. And so you want to make sure that you're looking for one that um, doesn't include any kind of chemical treatment or cleaner. Uh, for dry and powdery leather books, sometimes you'll see that they're just starting to flake apart. Um, you will see on the market leather dressing. And although this was something that librarians used to apply to leather books to make them shiny and glossy, over time what they do is they sort of exude this fatty bloom that sometimes can look like mold. And it can just sort of cause a larger problem in the end and doesn't really help solve the flaking. So we recommend not using any sort of 
leather dressing. And if your book is starting to flake, wrap it in paper or in worst case scenarios, put it in a box and that'll really help it out. All right, so now let's talk about the care of textiles. Now this kind of opens up a larger discussion about how you're using all of these objects. If this is, if you're trying to wash a quilt and you've washed it many times before and you feel comfortable doing it, um, I don't wanna prevent you from washing it again. But if there is a textile that you haven't washed before, um, I don't recommend washing it. There's a lot of, um, variables that can enter into a washing a, a garment. Dyes, for example, can bleed and that can really cause irreversible damage. So in general, we don't really recommend that you wash anything, but vacuuming can be another really great strategy. <clears throat> If you have an heirloom textile that you believe requires cleaning or mending, we recommend that you contact a textile conservator or high-end dry cleaner for further guidance. But let's talk about the vacuuming because that is something that you can do at home. And again, it uses one of those little attachment kits. And for objects that are like rugs or quilts, you'll see here on this picture on the left that you just take a simple screen and place it over the top. And then you can just gently tap your brush down the edge. And that really helps to remove a lot of the dust without sucking up your textile into the vacuum at the same time. If you have something that's even more fragile or there's components that you're worried about losing, you can always take, again, a natural fiber brush and brush the dust in towards the vacuum. And we recommend that you cover up the nozzle with a little bit of cheesecloth or screen. And that way, if you do accidentally detach something, you don't lose it in the vacuum. So other general dusting guidelines really depend on the security of your object. For paintings, you can use one of these brushes that I was talking about. It's called a hockey brush. And um, I gave Melissa a handout kind of last minute, so I'm hoping I can distribute it to you all. But we have a whole list of vendors that supply a lot of materials that you can purchase online. And I have a link to this hockey brush. And so I'll make sure that you guys get that resource. But this is a really great tool for dusting paintings. You'll just want to be sure that the surface is very secure. If you see bits that are flaking or really extreme impasto, I'd recommend maybe just bringing that to a paintings conservator so that they can clean it in a different way. But dusting can really help to take care a lot of a lot of the bulk material. And you just start at the top and just gently sweep the dust downward. You can do the same technique with ceramics and metal cloths. If it's a smooth surface, a stable ceramic, for example, like the one pictured here on the left, a microfiber cloth will work just fine as well. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about storage strategies. So plastic bags and acidic paper and cardboard shoe boxes, we all find them in our home. This picture on the far left are some cardboard boxes filled with photos that I am working on sorting through during this quarantine. Um, but they're really not ideal storage containers for long-term storage. They can really um, exude a lot of acidity into your objects. And in the case of these plastics, plastic bags, they can actually leach a lot of fillers um, into your objects. So we don't recommend them. What we do recommend are storage materials that have a couple of different qualities that I'm going to talk about. And again, um, the vendors that are on this handout I'll send you uh, will offer a lot of these materials. But as you're shopping around, you're going to want to look for two key terms, and that is that the box is lignin-free and alkaline buffered. Even with a lot of these vendors, sometimes they don't list that material, and so I would steer clear of it. Terms like archival and preservation sound good, but if you don't see lignin-free and alkaline buffered, I'd steer clear of it because you don't actually know what that material is made of. So what is lignin? Um, lignin is a naturally occurring substance that is found in plants. It helps hold the plant straight up and together. Um, but unfortunately, it also develops acidity very quickly when we turn it into a paper pulp and make a box out of it. So it can lead to the yellowing and the degradation of paper, for example. So they remove the lignin and they also then add an alkaline material. It's usually ca calcium carbonate. And what that does is it increases the pH of the pulp. And um, over time, as that box ages, it kind of buffers against that, that aging and buffers against uh, the natural acidity that builds up. So lignin-free and alkaline buffered is what you want to look for for all of your storage materials.
So I have another tip, and that is sometimes we have a lot of family papers that have a lot of tears and they're sort of falling apart. And maybe you've even talked to a conservator and getting everything mended is just sort of astronomically expensive. And I understand that that's, you know, just not always feasible. There are some good solutions around it. Tape is not one of them. Steer clear from ta of tape. Even archival tape can really cause a lot of problems. What I would get instead are these polyester L sleeves. So it, Mylar is the trade name for them. And an L sleeve just means that it's two sheets of this polyester that have been welded together on the top and the bottom, but you can use them really anyway. And this system kind of has a natural static charge to it. And so when you put your document in, um, even if it's very fragmented, it'll really help to hold it all together. And this is a really great solution to anyone who maybe grew up, including myself, with a lot of lamination. Definitely don't want to laminate your objects. It's incredibly difficult to reverse. I've done lots of treatments where I've removed lamination. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. And the solvents that we use are not good for the environment. So steer clear of lamination. And get these great L sleeves that you can find at various vendors. So I know we have a lot of quilters in our community, and maybe you also just have a really fantastic textile that you want to store. And I thought I would conclude by sharing um, some basic tips on how to store your quilt. So quilts are a really unique object because they are really sort of a multi-layered system. And so sometimes we recommend that you roll textiles, but in this case, rolling can actually compress that top layer and cause a lot more wrinkling. So we recommend folding your, folding your quilts. This is actually a quilt from the Spencer Museum of Art. Um, you always want to fold your quilt so that the face, the front, is facing out, and that helps to avoid compressing that more multi-layered um, side um, inward. I uh, put some dimensions here for a box, an alkaline buffered box that is a pretty good standard size to search for. A lot of vendors carry it and it can hold about two small quilts or one large quilt and it's not so big that it's going to be difficult to pull in and out of your closet. You, so you want to get this box that's alkaline buffered again and you'll also want to get some unbuffered tissue and I recommend getting unbuffered because the calcium carbonate, some some um, fabrics and additions in fabric can be a little bit alkaline sensitive, so just get something that's neutral, um, otherwise known as unbuffered. If you're still talking to the people you live with in your home during this quarantine, um, I recommend getting some help because it's always easier to do this with at least one other person. And um, you'll want to just set up kind of a clean space, hide your cats in another part of the house, make sure that um, all the hair is picked up. You can do this on a bed or you can lay down a clean sheet on the floor and fold up uh, your quilt that way. So once you've set up your area, um, I'm borrowing an image from the National Quilt Museum, um, you want to create sort of a long snake of your unbuffered tissue. What this is going to do is support all of your folds as you fold your quilt. One modification that I would make to the system though is that you wanna turn the quilt down so that the face is um, touching the floor and that way when you're done, the face is, is facing the right way out. So you want to make these long snakes and we recommend that you fold your quilt not along the fold lines that you've been using. So most quilts have been folded up in quarters and halves and what we suggest is that you inspect your quilt and come up with a way of folding it that um, doesn't continue to use those same creases and then makes them weaker and weaker. So thirds usually works pretty well. You can line up your box to measure it. And then once it's been rolled lengthwise, you can see that it, all the folds have been padded out with these little tubes of tissue paper. Then you can fold it the opposite direction, again, padding out every fold with more tissue. Then it can be placed inside your box and lined with more unbuffered tissue, making sure you cover the top. And then you can label it and mitigate against that risk of disassociation. So I want to be mindful of the time and leave room for question and answers. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Jacinta. That was really interesting. Um, I do have some questions that have come in. 
One is a question about clothing moths. Mm. Does keeping items in a cedar closet help against that? And what's the best preventive treatment for them? Great. Well, if you, if you have clothing moths, what I would recommend is bagging them up and bagging up the textile that has the infestation calling a textile conservator. And my handout has at the end a link so that um, where you can use the American Institute for Conservation's find a conservator search and you can get in touch with a textile conservator. In this case, you may be able to just talk to someone over the phone if there isn't someone local. Um, and discuss a, a treatment method for the clothing moth. But as far as the cedar chest goes, yeah, that's a, um, an old technique that works really well to guard against a lot of pests. The only issue with cedar chests is that they, um, they have a lot of oils in them and those oils can interact with your, the, your object and um, can cause some staining. It can, um, it's usually a lot of staining that takes place. And so you can still use your chest. What I would just recommend is that you put your um, textile inside a box and then place that box inside the chest. Okay. Just have some kind of buffer in between. Um, we also have a question, what kind of gloves should I wear when handling old photos to protect them from hand oils? Ah, that's a great question. I didn't talk about gloves. Um, so in general, in the museum world, we do have glove policies for handling certain objects. For works on paper, we just say wash your hands with soap and water um, because wearing gloves can kind of take away some of your hand dexterity. But um, you are keen to ask because photographic materials are very sensitive. And so um, we do suggest or we require at the museum and the libraries that nitrile gloves are used for handling all photographs. But I also recognize that in the home environment, that's not always possible or feasible. And a one way around it is that you can handle your photographs by the edges, make sure, making sure you wash your hands with soap and water ahead of time. And actually that reminds me, now that we're all professional hand washers and also have a lot of access to hand sanitizer, I always recommend soap and water over hand sanitizer because sanitizers can leave residues behind. So only soap and water when handling your, your family heirlooms. Another um, option is to take a folder, um, just like a you know acid-free folder and place your photograph inside it and then you can use that to handle it. Okay. Um, so, okay, so another question here is, what is a good method for removing oil deposits on books and natural fiber items which have accumulated over time from cooking in the house? Hmm. Oil deposits from natural... F this sounds like a story to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess my question would be, you know, why do you want to remove the stains? Is this something that... Um, just isn't pleasing to the eye anymore? And how do you plan to use the object in the future? Because removing oil stains is, is potentially possible. I would only, um, I would recommend going to a conservator to discuss those options. There isn't, you know, a, a quick and easy method that I can describe for you. Um, a lot of times this has to be tested um, before we know what is safe and possible. But sometimes these oil deposits are, are just sort of um, an aesthetic problem, not really a condition problem. And so, again, I think I'd need to know a little bit more about the object and how you plan to use it to give you some good advice. Okay. Um, so um, we also have a person who has a late 1800s Irish lace-trimmed pillowcases with a bunch of starch already in them and somewhat permanent folds. Would you suggest just leaving them be or what would you suggest for that? Well, I think it would go back to how you plan to use these pillowcases. If you want to store them um, and keep them safe so that you can pass them down to a family member or a friend, um, you may want to refold them and pad them out sort of using those unbuffered tissue sausages snakes that I was showing you for the quilt. Um, you can always lay your so the pillowcases 
probably aren't that big, so you could always lay them out flat, and that oftentimes can help sort of passively reduce some of that creasing. But again, it kind of comes down to how you're, how you're planning on using it. Um, sometimes um, some gentle steaming can work, but again, I think that would be a good conversation to have with a conservator because there might be some elements that are quite sensitive to, um, to be aware of before you go and do that. But um, a lot of this, um, conservators are getting really good at using Zoom now. So um, I'm hoping very much that I can get this handout to you all. It also includes my email address. So if you, I know some of these questions we weren't really able to fully flush out. So if you want to continue the conversation, feel free to email me. And I'll stick that in the chat too, actually, just in case. That would be great. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you very much. That was really informative and interesting. I have a whole list of questions I'd like to consult you about at some point in the future. I, I collect uh, international textiles, so. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. I know, it's such a short period of time, it was hard to decide what information to share, but right. um, I hope this will, will give you all a starting place. I think it's doing a really good job of that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your attention.